Oh, well, one thing I, I do encourage everyone to do is find a mentor. I think that's so powerful is to have someone that's in a role that you're either attempting to pursue or in a role that you're actually already pursuing or in. Um, and I tell people to actually find someone that they can give you the the real deal on a particular career path. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone that's going to lecture you or, you know, someone that's going to tell you, you want someone to guide you, which means they give you the facts and you make your own decision. So are we less open to interacting with strangers online or more open? Because I thought of that today or yesterday because we were talking about, you know, somebody somebody brought that up in our like little shindig, our, our, our tiny little shindig. It was like, you just don't like we're not we used to be so more. Yeah, he, he, he was talking about he got on a flight and um, he's just more wary of people now uh and this is like a friend of a friend and he was just saying we we're just i'm more wary of strangers like you're saying now and i'm just wondering when you're like looking for jobs on linkedin or reaching out to people are people not to say that this is a germ thing it's just like you're so uh you're so isolated these days are you just like not up for like talking to new people or meet you know having those kind of interactions I think I've seen some of the opposite and also, you know, not just being receptive to people reaching out, but also extending video calls rather than phone calls. Now, some of that might be because of the fact that people don't want to give out their personal phone numbers right. and a Zoom link is a little bit more anonymous in that way. But I think also it's just like that. OK, if we're going to do this and we're both at home and we're both by our computers. I get let's jump on a video because that's going to be a little bit more of like a human interaction, intimate than just a random like phone call for your informational interview. So I've actually almost seen that people are more receptive and actually giving of more time and of themselves, which I, to your point, I, I'm always kind of a little bit surprised by. I'm like, I'm kind of like, oh, no, no, no. I just I just really wanted to f like a five minute, would like to ask you a question about something. I was like, oh, okay, no, I'll, I'll set aside a half an hour and like sit and talk to you and, you know, see you as a person. And like, you know, that's a, uh, there's a benefit to that too. No, it's, you're absolutely right because, I uh, had an informational interview this this uh, this week, and uh, the the woman she she was fantastic to talk to. We talked for like an hour, and I was so shocked. She told me all about all about her 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 company and her industry and all these things, and I got to learn so much about what she did. But it was so odd because I thought, oh my god. I she I thought she would just want to get off this call as as soon as humanly possible, but she gave me so much useful information, and we talked so long, and I thought, holy crap! Like, may, may, maybe people are just like you said, more receptive to wanting to talk to strangers because we're just so we've been talking to the same people for an entire year. So I don't know. That was my just FYI, my check in, my one thing I did for me for my career this this week. Nice. Yeah. Which uh, goes into our letter of the week, our sponsor of the week. Our rejection letter of the week actually comes from Social Talent. They actually have a, a post uh, on this where they have a couple examples. This one is from Cadbury, if you all know the chocolate. They write, Dear Miss Jones, we regret to inform you that your application for the position of Global Quality Manager has been unsuccessful. We don't normally respond to unsuccessful applicants, but in your case, we made an exception in order to turn the five pound note you attach to the reference section of your application under the line Elizabeth wink wink some notes regarding your application one listing super secret spy work I illegally can't talk about as your previous experience won't fool anyone two in future you might want to refrain from using sentences like come on let me be part of this awesome gig you've got going on three eBay feedback isn't relevant reference four your attached sketch of an everlasting chocolate bar was unwarranted absurd and quite frankly it scared us a little bit we wish you the best in your future endeavors. Sincerely, the person. Whoa, what? I don't know. I have no words for this rejection letter. <laughs> that's that's something. But yeah, all right. Well, 
that's our sponsor of the week. Uh, guys, please send us your rejection letters, acceptance letters at willworkforpodcast at gmail.com. That's willwork, the number four podcast at gmail.com. We want to hear from you guys. We want to keep this going. And yeah, I think, Brendan, we might we might change this, we might change it up and just do acceptance letters from for a little bit so we can put some more positivity out in the air. Oh, also, just so you know, in the show notes, we have our odd rec link. And, and that's really an opportunity for you all to reach out, kind of let us know what you'd like us to talk about, maybe who you think we should interview, and then kind of, you know, see where we're at in the creation process for some of our other episodes. So we'd love to hear from you, whether as a comment or uh, or an uptick in our other link. Yeah. And uh, on with the show. Uh, We're joined here today by Bridget Baggett, who is a career strategist and diversity consultant. Previously, she worked as the Director of Career Development and Engagement at Morehouse University, where she supported students with long-term career development, job placement, advancement. Before that, she was working as a trainer and facilitator of career innovations with their HR-related issues and trainings. But now, the reason we have her joining us is her work with Twisted Career, which we're going to get into, which is kind of this community where she's building people up. And helping them, you know, realize all of their career goals. So, thank you for being with us today, Bridget. Yeah, one of the things that we were hoping to talk to you about, just based on uh, you know some of the posts that you've done recently on your social media sites, is around pivoting. And so, I guess kind of a an opening question is just when or why should people maybe start to think about pivoting in their career? Well, I think that um, people should think about pivoting when um, they either outgrown their career. And some of the signs that you can see um, when you've outgrown your career is just um, being able to see either that your skill set is either not being used or underutilized. Um, Sometimes when we approach a position, we um, look for different tasks or different type of assignments or different goals that we want to meet in that position that we uh, ultimately accept. And once you get to the point where either those tasks or goals are no longer a value to you, or you find that you develop new skill sets that are not being utilized in that position, you definitely want to think about looking for other positions that can leverage those newfound skill sets. Um, also, there's a, a, another side to pivoting your career is um, can be due to being totally burnt out from your current role. Um, I've seen people that have taken on roles that do not have a, um, I should say, a work-life balance. Um, and when you take on roles that you are consumed with work, 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 and you find yourself working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, it may be time for you to take a step back and find a, a role that's going to be able to fit in your life that you're able to have a life outside of work. Um, And that can kind of bleed into other toxic behaviors that you see at the workplace that people decide to um, either change careers totally or at least find a new employer, if that makes sense. No, totally. And and I guess the follow-up to that is where in that process, where do you see people needing the most support, right? Like I think people can have those feelings and thoughts and like, you know, definitely start to physically manifest it, but then how how do they seek support and how do you kind of help in that process? Well, how I help is I, I try to focus on their why. Um, a lot of time when people decide to make a career change, believe it or not, is not really driven by their why. Most of the time there's a... Um, a issue or shift in their life that's happened um, usually is surrounded by, you know, they either have to move, demographics, um, something in their life has changed. Um, they may have pursued or um, got a new certification or degree. So they feel a sense of entitlement. Well, you know, I should be making more money now or I should have a better title now. And, and that's another one. A lot of time people focus about uh, around compensation as well. Um, after a certain amount of time, um, they should get more than just the COL, which is the cost of living um, increase. Um, so what you want to focus on is your why. And that's kind of the hard part that people kind of think is very generalized. Well, I know what I want to do. Um, and I used to tell that when I worked at a collegiate level, we had a lot of students that came in and they kind of figured they know what they wanted to do until they did it. And I know a lot of people have gotten to jobs <laughs> and outside looking in is like the perfect position. Like, oh, my God, I can see myself in this role. And when they get in it, they're like, what is this? You know, 
that actually happened to me starting in my early, early career back in my college days, I swore I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I told this story plenty of times. Um, and I actually went to school to be a veterinarian. And a lot of people don't know that my undergrad is actually animal science and biology. I was on the path to go to vet school, went to a school that had a vet school until I worked with a vet. Um, and I'm in Atlanta and I went to school in Alabama. So right next door where um, a lot of the clientele aren't puppies and kittens, you know, in Alabama, <laughs> you have a lot of rural air animals. So we're talking about, you know, goats and pigs and livestock. And I'm like, hold on. I did not see this on Animal Planet. Where are the puppies and kittens? That's what I'm, that's what I want. And it, kind of just totally shift my whole mind on what a veterinarian was. And it's not just vaccinating kittens and puppies all day. You know, these th this is the real life day in the life of a vet. So I tell people to understand their why, and it has to be more than just something that you want to do. Because like I said, once you get in there, you realize what you want to do is not actually what you're going to be doing. <laughs> so how do you, how do you break down those barriers? and get to their why explicitly and help them understand, you know, you're, you're doing this for the wrong reason or the right reason or guide them in that way. Oh, well, one thing I, I do encourage everyone to do is find a mentor. I think that's so powerful is to have someone that's in a role that you're either attempting to pursue or in a role that you're actually already pursuing or in. Um, and I tell people to actually find someone that they can give you the, the real deal on a particular career path. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone that's going to lecture you or, you know, someone that's going to tell you, you want someone to guide you, which means they give you the facts and you make your own decision. Um, and how you do that is by be, just being simply open and honest and wanting to just learn more either about an organization or about a particular role. And you can do that easily by sending out just a warm introduction about yourself. It starts with that, you know, when you first wanted to find out about a particular role or career you want to pivot into. And then you also want to do the work on yourself, you know, and that's really where you, you know, you bring out the pencil and paper and you really start to break down what your long-term goals are. Where do you see yourself? Where do you want to be? And what career path is going to get you there? What does that look like? And I tell everybody, every position or job you have is not going to be your dream job. You know, sometimes you have to work jobs. Um, sometimes I hate to say they are a means to an end. You know, you are going to take on roles that you don't like. You are going to take on jobs that, you know, at that time may not be a fit. But some people or many people understand that that finally make it to the role that they want, that all those positions that they had were necessary steps to position them to the position that they really want to pursue. Yeah, I love that. I think that that kind of speaks maybe even to the conversations that we keep having with people on our podcast. And it's around this idea of, of how do you start to kind of understand and see that pathway. Um, and so, you know, the mentorship model, I think, is one that we haven't heard anyone talk about. I think it's really important. Are there any other like tools or resources that you recommend to people as they start to to do that kind of personal research? Personal research, um, I, I think that being able to understand what you want, so being able to either do a self-assessment on yourself, um, that means doing your own research, um, reading, going out there, finding resources that can kind of give you insight on a particular role or position that you want. Another key in addition to mentorship is networking. Um, a lot of people leverage networking only when they're looking to make a career move. Um, and I think, you know, networking gets a bad rap when you're only using it to gain something. And you don't want to be the person that always reaches out when they're looking for their next opportunity. And we all know how it feels that, you know, we all either have res re relatives or friends. And I used to say that <laughs> your phone rings, you already know, oh, Lord, they want something. <laughs> that's the only time they reach out is when they want something. So I tell people, do not use networking as a tool that you're only going to reach out to people or put your or put your um, your network on notice when you're looking for a job. They can smell desperation. They can smell needing this a mile away because it's almost as if, okay, you're only reaching out to me because I'm working for a company that you want in on. 
Um, so you definitely want to be able to network, but also I used to, um, I also used the term nurture your network, which means that you always want to nurture your network in a way that you're a resource. Um, put out things in your industry that may be intriguing for people in the positions that you want to be in, whether that's, you know, resources, maybe that's current events, maybe that's networking opportunities. You want to come across as an expert or as somewhat of a leader in that particular industry. And you can do that with your network, but you have to leverage it, not when you need them, but nurture them through the entire process. So that's a very interesting concept. And, you know, you've worked at Morehouse, so you have uh, worked with a lot of individuals who probably don't have networks. And mm-hmm. so how do you how do you help people build those networks? And what does the nurturing look like? And what does the networking look like? Well, the nurturing looks like already pretty much keeping in tune with your existing network. So these are people that you may have already worked with or maybe co-workers. These may be people that you've already went to school with. Uh, So these are people that are already in your network that you want to continuously nurture. And how you do that is um, you keep them up to date with things going on. So either using um, LinkedIn is a great way and a great platform to keep your network in the know, even if it's something as simple as, hey, I'm going to share an article about something that's current in my particular industry, or maybe I'll uh, share a process that I may have improved on my particular job. Um, So you want to, you want to definitely keep in touch with your, your current network. And when you network to get new individuals, or you want to network to get new professionals, this is when you start to leverage either professional organizations, you can uh, level, um, leverage alumni associations. Um, You can also leverage uh, events that surround your particular industry. Um, And now since we're like in this, this totally virtual, this virtual environment, this has created almost a the best way to network people, network with people that you may have never met face to face. You know, there's a lot of people that I've reached out to that I normally would have never ran into in Georgia. You know, um, Mm. I I have people that I network with that are in Boston that are in LA that I would never have met at a, you know, at a meet and greet, you know, so this is the time right right now to start leveraging this, this virtual environment, because there's people that are, you know, maybe hundreds of miles away, but may have a connection that they can get you in touch with to bring you closer to your goals. Well, and I think that's a, a really great way to segue into what I feel like you're building a twisted career. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about like the mission and vision that you see with this, this program and this site, because it seems like a, a community model is what you're doing. And it seems it's around this idea of like nurturing and building and having this kind of ability to connect to the people that you work with. So can you speak a little to, so what is Twisted Career to you? What are you trying to build? Well, Twisted Career came to me um, and, and a little of my backstory. I was actually laid off from Morehouse College um, back in, I want to say back in the summer of 2020. And this is with many people, uh, especially the hospitality industry and education as well, was hit hard with layoffs. So um, what I wanted to really find a way to bring together people that have different twists and turns in their career path, because I'm a, a living testimony of that, of a person that started out swearing they were going to be a veterinarian. Um, and here I am now <laughs> in human resources and, and career development. Um, so it is a community type of platform I want to put together, though I do offer uh, one-on-one coaching and different type of resume writing services. You have to keep in mind, that's just a piece of it. I think that majority of people's opportunities come through their network. I can attest that 90% of the opportunities I've had through my career has come through a referral. Um, I may have got one or two jobs that I've had in my lifetime that I actually applied to, got a call back. But usually most of the, the, the big jobs that I've had have been by someone referring me. And I really want people to understand and be able to leverage that. So I'm creating through Twisted Career a network where not only educates people through a membership type of platform, but also brings together like-minded individuals that can build each other's networks together. So it would include, you know, having expert speakers come in and speak, being able to network with people in different industries, um, being able to leverage other people's uh, 
um, platforms and networks to get you know, in, in, in front of decision makers and also being able to have the professional development piece to help mold them into the professional that they need to be to to undertake the positions that they desire. So that's what Twisted Career is, 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 is a, a network that I'm trying to build or a membership I'm trying to build to bring professionals and like minds together to uplift each other's throughout their twisted career paths. That kind of leads into a question I'm wondering because you just said, oh, 90% of the jobs I got was because somebody referred me and I can hear somebody out there being like, oh, well, God, like no one's going to refer me. I don't have a network. I don't know what's going on. Um, how? And it seems like this is a problem that you're trying to solve at Twisted Career. But I, mm-hmm. I guess my specific question would be when you're networking with somebody, how do you get to that level where they can refer you or how you get that relationship going to, to be that you're the person that they think of when they, when there is a job opportunity that arises. You have to be seen, you have to be noticed. And one of the things that I'm actually making as an evergreen is the LinkedIn challenge. I did it once. It was a five day LinkedIn challenge. And that was to get people to actually use their LinkedIn. We have a lot of people out there that have LinkedIn accounts, but they're not using it. I can tell you this, um, and this is how I know that if you become visible, if you become a voice of your industry in some type of capacity, people notice. Um, And I can account for that is when I got laid off from my previous position. And of course, I had a whole network at my fingertips because I worked directly with um, hiring managers. Um, But it was at a time where people weren't really you know, hiring. And a lot of the hiring was on a standstill because every, as you know, everything was shut down. Um, People didn't know how they were going to take care of their internal staff, let alone onboard new employees. So a lot of the hiring was put on hold. So you have to think from that time up until the end of um, this year, end of last year, 2020, everybody was kind of at a standstill because they didn't know what was going to happen. It wasn't until I started to put Twisted Career together and started to post and started to put myself out there. People just came out the woodwork and was like, hey, are you looking for something? I've gotten interviews. I've gotten requests. I have gotten so many opportunities just by doing something why I didn't have a job. Like I didn't have a job. I was kind of on the on the on the uh, fence about either going back into the workforce or going full force with my business. And since kind of the economy was on the rocks, I said, well, let me go ahead and do what I know. And that's career development. And I just start putting out uh, material, putting out blogs, actually posting and people notice. So what I say about that is if someone's out there unsure of where to start, start with a post. Start with a follow, you know, people underutilize that feature on LinkedIn. You don't have to connect with everyone. You can follow people. Start with that, you know, and once you start to do that, people will notice, you know, not to say don't apply, still apply. But I encourage you as you apply, be also aware of what you're applying to and the people that work at the company that you apply for. So that way you can start to follow and network with them. Um, and believe me, it works. It definitely works. Yeah, I think that's a great use of it's kind of a low lift too, right? Like this, mm-hmm. that's something that we all have access to. You can start doing that today. You know, it could be, you know, just a casual thing that you're thinking about or related to the the work that you want to do. Based on your experiences, both, you know, in these different places you've been and even in the work that you've been doing the last few months, like what are some of the areas, like the skill gaps or areas of need that you think that people really could start to build into? Like if they're, if they're thinking that I need to start developing myself a little bit more, what are some of those areas that you'd recommend they look at? Um, I think that for technology or technical skills is something that I think everyone can approve on, especially now, since we are moving through this in virtual environment, um, brush up on those skill sets. I also think project management and time management is definitely a a skill set that needs to be mastered, um, being able to um, prioritize things in a timely manner, um, having the communication skills to communicate when things aren't going as planned. Um, a lot of times uh, the ball gets dropped when all it took was an email or all it took was a, a form of communication that definitely could have prevented something that 
that drastically happen in a result of just not simply communicating. So I think the soft skills of being able to um, leverage your project management, your time management, as well as your communication skills. And I think for your hard skills, definitely your technical skills. I'm seeing a lot of employers um, either looking for people that have some insight on leveraging the different technologies out there to streamline processes. So regardless of what role you're in, you definitely want to make sure that you're on top of those. What about, you know, do you have anything that you talk to clients about a lot with this, the remote life? Like, I think that, you know, remote work is definitely going to be the reality for probably at least six months to maybe another year, you know, and we'll see and, and, and normalize in different ways. So uh, have you have you found some quick tips that you're often coaching your your clients with around you know remote work and, and remote job searching? I think time management is a big piece of virtual um, um, being able to work in a virtual environment. I find that people are working longer hours because they're not going into the office. So you find yourself on your computer, on your laptop for longer days uh, because you physically do not have to leave your home. Um, so you want to make sure that you're balancing that out because what happens that you're giving an expectation that you're going to respond to an email at eight o'clock because you did last week. You know, so you're setting a tone that you may not want to move forward with on a long term basis. So you definitely want to be able to do that. Set your boundaries when you're working online. Um, Also, if you're if you're job searching, um, I have tools and I know I'll be opening that up that um, you'll be able to be able to track your job search, be able to see what you're applying to and be able to grade your resume towards that. There's different tools out there. I know that's something that Twisted Career is offering with the membership. Um, and you want to be able to do that and keep track of the positions that you're applying to and carve out a time of day that you're going to apply, the time of day that you want to follow up. And you want to stick to that particular plan. You do not want your, and, I, and I've seen people get burnt out on using their entire day applying to positions and they're not applying to positions effectively because they're so worried about applying to the most positions. You know, I got to apply to 20 positions a day. Why don't you apply to five that actually you actually are going to get a call back on? Put all your energy into four or five that you know that I can reach out to these five decision makers. I have a better chance of getting a call back. I have a better chance of getting in a, in a, in a, um, an introduction versus um, consuming your time with trying to apply to 20, if that makes sense. Um, quality over quantity. So I really urge people not to have a a number stuck in their head on how many jobs they should apply to, but how many jobs do you want to effectively apply to that you can get a a a return on your time? Mm -hmm. A little bit of a of a push and just an open ended question. You know, you you talked about just the realities of this past year and and kind of what that's allowed for both opportunity and then also need. And so. One of the areas that I'm, I'm curious with your background, both as a diversity consultant and in this career strategy piece, like what what changes in the workforce are you hoping to see we start to push into and build and demand uh, kind of as a response to what we've seen during the pandemic and around these subjects of diversity, equity and inclusion? I really think that, you know, everything has opened this conversation of what's happened in not only um the economic, but also the political uh, environment that we've had for the past 12 months. Um, So I think that companies are now listening when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And what that does is opens up the doors for voices to be heard. Um, A lot of the things that are happening within companies have been happening for decades. This is, is nothing new under the sun. I think what's happening now that people are now being heard. Uh, is now becoming is now coming to the forefront of companies' minds because now they have to deal with it. Um, it's no longer a box that can be checked. It has to be not only checked but implemented. And if it's not, you know, you're going to hear about it. You know, as you can see, um, even as we move through um, the hiring efforts, um, as well as being able to bring more diversity to companies, um, companies are now you know, putting on paper that they're committing to X amount of um, hires within their organization. So what does that look like? Are positions being created? Are these positions that already exist? 
Um, so what we have to do is take a step back and see, okay, what what do we want as an organization or what do organizations want when it comes to diversity? What does that look like? Um, and being able to get diversity in levels where they're making the decisions is really where it's going to be crucial. Um, Cause these are the ones that can, I, I tell people extend that olive branch to pull somebody up that normally they would not have been referred. And that's the, um, th- that's one thing about referral programs. When you, refer everyone that you you know looks like you or you refer everyone that you went to school with or in your on your particular um circle um it it can't be too diverse because everyone's your friend you know so i think that we also have to look at other ways to bring people in organizations other than just referral programs as well um and being able to really look at what does cultural fit mean. I'm hearing a lot of people that also bring this up as, well, I didn't get a position because I wasn't a cultural fit or I wasn't a fit. What does that exactly mean? You know, um, and I actually had a, a post about that. You know, sometimes you just have people that just don't like you. It has nothing to do with your expertise. It has nothing to do with your abilities. You just have employers that, hey, I interviewed this person. They brought me the wrong way. I'm not going to hire them. And that's okay too, you know, and you have to accept that. And it, it's not always about diversity or discrimination. It just can be flat out, you know, you guys' personalities didn't mesh. So um, I think that's a conversation as well. So, yeah. What, what, what can we do as employees to do that, to make that happen? Is be open, um, like I said, be open to vi- diversity and be open to, um, um, to non-traditional hiring efforts, you know, um, and that even goes with co- companies. Don't go to the top tier schools that you normally go to, you know, um, try out other schools with different diverse populations. There's organizations when they recruit, they go to the same universities and the same colleges and you get the same type of employees, you know, so you have to actually tweak your hiring efforts as well to get diversity in your pipelines. Um, and that's why I say even with referral programs, it has to be a point where you have to put a limit on how many people's friends you can hire. You know, what does that look like? You know, what does it look like to bring someone in that does not have every single thing that's in that job description? Because that person may not look like everyone else that currently works there, you know, and also with a staffing and recruiting background, you want to make sure that you're even putting out job descriptions or JDs that actually target people of diversity. We know if we read a job description and it doesn't appeal to us, we don't apply. You know, so we also have to be able to train employers. What does that look like to put out a job description that actually is um, enticing to people of color or people um, of different diverse backgrounds? This has been great, and I want to respect your time. So where can we find you? All of my social medias are at Twisted Career. So um, IG, twist, um, IG, Twitter, is a, and as well as LinkedIn is Twisted Career. You can find me at www.twistedcareer.com, and you can find me on LinkedIn under Twisted Career or by my first and last name, Bridget Baggett. It was really interesting to hear her takes on networking and nurturing that environment. Yeah. And I guess, you know, that idea of just going on LinkedIn and and starting that process, I think is also really helpful because so often we talk about how do I make that connection, but instead Mm -hmm. it's almost like, no, I, I can, I can generate my own contacts through, through my person. Right. Right. My idea is, the way that I want to do it. And then people can also kind of come and inter- interact with me. And I think that that goes back to some of the other prompts we've heard from other people about the way to use LinkedIn and way to reach out to recruiters, but, but does so in a way that doesn't feel, you know, as direct and specific. It was great how she was connecting her two loves and how she's, you know, creating this new platform and environment where people can develop and thrive and hopefully, you know, go after those, those dreams. But you know, the, the sheer reality of two is like, man, sometimes you just need the lights to be on in your house. So, uh, I don't understand. Well, because she was saying that, you know, like not every job is ideal, 
yeah, that sometimes it's going to be a stepping stone that you're going to do something and then you'll do something else. And not every job is going to be your ideal um, dream job, but that it might be just a building block to somewhere else. And you kind of went into that too with the specific skills that you should be building and the technical skills and how we just, and I struggle with this as well. My job is like, Things I learn here, even though this isn't my ideal job, will apply to other things. It will help me grow and get to that position that where I where I want. And if you are going to do that, you need to focus on those skills and build them and actually become, you know, good at them. 